Welcome. My name is Wayne Grudem. This is a talk on Proverbs 4.23, Keep Your Heart with All Vigilance. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word, for its truthfulness, for its power, for its clarity, for the source of wisdom that you've given us in your word. We ask now that you would help us as we look at your word together, that you would teach us and teach our hearts as well as our minds. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So this afternoon, I want to talk with you about only one verse in the Bible. If you want to turn to that verse, it's Proverbs 4.23. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. The New American Standard Bible says, Watch over your heart. NIV says, guard your heart. All three translations have the idea of caring for or protecting or guarding your heart. Now, <clears throat> in the Bible, our heart is what's really deep inside us. It includes our emotions, yes. But more than that, it includes our deepest thoughts and convictions, our desires, our heart includes the whole of our inward moral and spiritual life, particularly in relationship to God. The context in Proverbs 4.23 is that of a father speaking to a son. The father is saying, this is how life works. This is, this is my wisdom from the, eight, the years that I've lived. And he said, my son, listen to my voice, verse 20. And I can say after... 42 years of seminary teaching, after watching thousands of students come and go, some to wonderful, productive ministries, some to shipwrecked lives, and destroyed homes, and destroyed churches, I have seen Proverbs 4.23 prove so remarkably true in the lives of hundreds of students that I have followed. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. The verse tells us that our inward moral and spiritual life will determine the course of our life and ministry, whether or not it will be a life that knows God's favor and God's blessing. What does it mean to keep your heart with all vigilance? With all vigilance. The Hebrew text quite literally could be translated, more than all guarding, keep your heart. More than you guard your apartment, your flat, more than you guard your house, you lock it, you keep more than that, keep your heart. More than you guard your bank balance, keep your heart. More than you guard your children or grandchildren, keep your heart, guard your heart. More than you guard your life, your health, keep your heart. And so we should ask ourselves, have we been doing that? Have we been making the condition of our heart a more important concern than anything else? It means that from time to time, we may have to give less attention to some other good things. Family, job, physical exercise, church meetings, house repair, car repair, washing the car. More than all these things, Proverbs 4.23 says, you can't neglect your heart. Sometimes we may have to give less attention to some good things but not to our heart. Now, if the verse says to keep your heart, to keep it, to guard it, that means our hearts are not evil. There's a goodness to our heart, a goodness to be protected and guarded. But when I say that, somebody out there is thinking, but wait, Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? You were thinking that. <laughs> I don't think Jeremiah 17, 9 is entirely true of the regenerate heart, the heart of someone who's been born again through trusting in Jesus Christ. In fact, a little later in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, God through Jeremiah promises that a new covenant is coming when God will write his law on our hearts. And the New Testament doesn't speak of our heart as entirely evil. 
Romans 5, 5. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Romans 6, 17. Thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have, been, have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. Hebrews 10, 22. Let us draw near, that is draw near to God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. 1 John 3.21, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. So our hearts have been changed as we've come to trust in Christ. But, although there's a goodness to our hearts, our hearts are not perfect. You can't always follow your heart because there are some warnings in the New Testament that our hearts can be led astray. James 3.14, if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. James 4.8, purify your hearts, you double-minded. That's why Proverbs 4.23 warns us, keep your heart with all vigilance because it can go astray. In the 1600s, the Puritan writer John Flavel wrote several hundred pages on this verse, as Puritans were tending to do. But he said about this verse that a heart is like a musical instrument. You tune it and then bump it and it goes out of tune or hang it on the wall for a few days and it's out of tune again. I saw this happen in my own life when I was working on the translation committee for the English Standard Version Bible. We were working in Cambridge, England at Tyndall House 12 of us on the committee, and we had, we had long days of work getting the wording of the Bible exactly as we thought it was best translated. It was wonderfully exciting work, interesting work, but very tiring. And then we didn't realize the problem, but Crossway Books had booked us into a hotel where the evening meal was included with the price of the room, so we had to eat in that hotel every night and they started supper at six, and then it was slow and slow and slow, and one course after another, and changed the forks and changed the knives, and supper was long. Then I'd get back to the room, and there was email to deal with, and I wanted to spend some time with Margaret. I was getting to bed late, getting up early, getting to bed late, getting up early, and you can't lose concentration when you're working on a Bible translation. Say. You have some comment or suggestion to make in Matthew 18. You go out of the room to take a telephone call or use the restroom and you come back in and they're already on Matthew 19. Matthew 18 is in the Bible. You lost your chance. <laughs> <laughs> so it was wonderful but tiring. So I decided I could get a little more sleep by skipping my morning prayer time and Bible reading time, personal. After all, I was spending eight hours or more a day with 11 other scholars studying the Greek or Hebrew text of the Bible. Why did I need another Bible study of my own and prayer time? And after three or four days, I realized some things went wrong. And I wrote a note. Results of missing my private, personal Bible reading and prayer time. Pride, talking about myself a lot, talking about my own things like Palm Pilot, if you remember that. Often inwardly hoping people will praise me in a sermon or something. Lack of love for friends, irritability, relationships with friends just stall or put on hold. General inward feeling of unease, unsettledness, hard to concentrate on scripture and prayer, self-reliance, no peace. And I had to say first to Margaret, I'm sorry, I've been crabby lately. And the reason is I hadn't spent time with the Lord myself. And then I had to apologize to the translation committee, just take a minute or two of the first thing next morning and say, I neglected my time with the Lord and my heart hasn't been right. Our hearts can so easily go astray. Why should you keep your heart? There are two reasons. There's a reason in this verse and then there's a reason in the rest of the Bible. The reason in this verse is, for from it 
flow the springs of life. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. The Hebrew text is not easy to translate into something that sounds like good English. It's literally, for from it, from your heart, are the outgoings of life. Those of you who know Hebrew, it, the, the, the noun is totsaot. It's a plural noun formed on the same root as the verb yatsa, to go out. It's a noun, so it's the going outs, the goings out, the outflowing. From your heart is the outflowing of your life. From it, from it flow the springs of life. The picture is that your life is flowing out from your heart to impact others around you. I think Jesus had this verse in mind in Luke 6.45 where he said the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil, for out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. You're driving or riding a bicycle, and someone cuts you off in traffic. You open your mouth to bless or to curse. Your life is flowing out of your mouth to impact others. Mark 7, 21, for from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, out of the heart of man, evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within. Why do people do evil things? Why every once in a while do we see the pastor of a large church in some city has embezzled money from the church or has committed adultery and disgraced the ministry, brought great harm to families and ministries and churches and the reputation of the gospel. It came out of the heart. He didn't keep his heart with all vigilance. You see why the Bible tells us to keep our hearts above all guarding, above everything else? Every time you encounter a new situation, out of your heart comes the outgoings of your life. What is in your heart is constantly flowing out like a spring. The quality of your inward moral spiritual life is constantly impacting people around you, for from it flow the springs of life. Margaret and I have had friends from time to time who just love Jesus, and they love to pray, and being with them is spiritually refreshing because they have a life full of love for Christ and full of faith. Now, many of you have responsibilities, teaching and leadership responsibilities in a church or a seminary or on a campus. Many of you teach in a children's program or lead Bible studies or lead a home fellowship group. If your heart is full of self and pride, your interpretation of the Bible may be perfect. Your doctrine may be sound. But self and pride will also be what you communicate. It will flow out and infect those who hear you. If your heart is full of anger and bitterness, then anger and bitterness will be also what you communicate. If your heart is full of fear, then fear will flow out from you like a virus to affect others. If your heart is full of love for Jesus and faith in him, love for Jesus and faith will be the spring that flows from your heart and refreshes all who hear. This verse also gives us insight into why people in churches and colleges and seminaries stray into theological liberalism, denying the truthfulness of the Bible and denying many of its teachings. It begins when people's hearts start to stray from God and his word. Beginning in the 1820s, Charles Hodge was a professor at Princeton Seminary, professor of Oriental and Biblical Literature and later of Systematic Theology. Princeton at that time was the center of solid orthodox belief in the Bible and all that it teaches. Any faculty member at Princeton would have qualified to teach at the European Leadership Forum. But Charles Hodge took two years to go and study in Germany, 1826 to 1828. When he came back, he talked to students in the chapel at Princeton Seminary. And he asked, how was it that in the great former centers of Protestantism, especially Germany, but also other, other countries in Europe, how was it that Christianity had ceased to be even the nominal religion? 
Hodge said the cause was the decline of vital religion. Here is his statement, quote, Holiness is essential to the correct knowledge of divine things and the great security from error. Wherever you find vital piety, by vital piety means a warm, close relationship with the Lord. Wherever you find vital piety, there you find the doctrines of the fall, of depravity, of regeneration, of atonement, and of the deity of Jesus Christ. Hodge then exhorted seminary students, keep your hearts with all diligence, for from out of them are the issues of life. Holiness is, now, it, holiness is essential to correct knowledge of divine things and the great security from error. When men lose the life of religion, they can believe the most monstrous doctrines and glory in them. I think that even today, as throughout history, from time to time, God allows some error, some seemingly attractive doctrinal error to prosper in the world and many churches to test our hearts. Will we be true to him? Will we be faithful? The first reason to keep our heart then is for from it flow the springs of life. The second reason to keep our hearts is throughout the whole Bible, God is constantly testing people's hearts. We look from Genesis to Revelation at what the Bible says about the heart. Genesis 2, God gave a test to Adam and Eve. Were their hearts true and faithful to him or would they stray? By the time we get to Genesis 6, we read, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The rest of the Old Testament is the story of a search for a man after God's own heart who could lead God's people. God says to Saul, your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. So God was looking for a leader after his own heart and he found David, a man after his heart. But then David sinned with Bathsheba and David said in Psalm 51 verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And then Solomon followed the Lord for much of his life. But when he was old, 1 Kings 11.4 says, When Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God as was the heart of David his father. Then in 2 Chronicles 16.9, Asa the prophet says, The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. The Old Testament looks forward in hope to the new covenant when God would write his law on people's hearts, Jeremiah 31. In the New Testament, Jesus comes. He is truly a man after God's own heart, with a heart that is purer than that of David, with a heart that is wiser than Solomon. He is the one in whom the Father delights. Now, after the death and resurrection of Christ, for those of us who have trusted in Christ, who are in Christ, the Holy Spirit has already cleansed our hearts, but they're not yet completely pure. When Jesus returns, one day, when he appears, we shall be like him. One day, our hearts will be forever pure, and we will know the favor of God resting on us forever. Still today, I believe God tests our hearts. 1 Thessalonians 2.4 Paul says, just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. The Apostle Paul, through his ministry, was aware that God was testing his heart at every turn, in every city, in every talk that he gave, in every conversation he had. I believe still today, 2 Chronicles 16, 9 is true. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless, to those whose heart is blameless toward him. I think this afternoon and through this forum, God is searching our hearts, finding what is there. So the second reason we should keep our hearts is that the whole Bible shows that our hearts are very important to God. 
God lets different heart tests come into your life from time to time. Uh, I had a pastor friend who ate breakfast every week at the same restaurant, and he would meet people there. One day he paid for his breakfast and walked out and was putting his money in his wallet and there was $5 too much. And he turned around and went back into the restaurant and gave the $5 back to the cashier who was the manager of the restaurant. And she smiled and said, just testing you, Reverend. <laughs> God saw it and was pleased. A former student of mine, when I, from when I taught at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, he'd gone on to PhD work and he had just about finished his PhD and there was only one job op opportunity that opened to him. And they offered him a job if he would just change his conviction on one thing that the Bible taught. And if not, he wouldn't have the job. And he said he did not change. He would not change his viewpoint. And he lost the position and they went back to square one and started looking for someone else. And that time he had no job and he was about to finish his doctorate. And I saw him and said to him, I think the Lord sees this and he's pleased. And after that, I found he got a very responsible teaching position at a major university. God tested his heart and found that he could trust him. So for each of us, what will it be? Friends may turn against you. There may be unexpected illness, maybe a financial setback, perhaps difficulties with children, or a thousand other things. There may be a temptation to do wrong for the sake of great gain. In all of this, God is watching. Will we continue to trust in him? Will we not become bitter or resentful? Will you keep your heart with all vigilance? So what does it mean to keep your heart? Why should you keep your heart? And third, how can you keep your heart? This verse implies that you can know your heart, you can examine your heart, or else there's no sense telling us to guard it and to keep it. What do you see in your heart? If you're nervous or tense, just pray and say, what is it, Lord? What is troubling my heart? Will you make it right? If your heart is fearful and worried about something in the future, tell it to God. Lord, help me understand this fear. Help me to trust you in my heart. And don't pollute your heart. If you know there are movies or books or internet sites that pollute your heart, don't go there. Keep your heart with all vigilance. I believe one aspect of Christian maturity is learning to know your own heart. Know what it feels like when your heart is not right before God when you're arguing or pushing for something in the strength of the flesh, as I know that I have done sometimes in faculty meetings or committee meetings. Know what it feels like when the Holy Spirit convicts your heart. <clears throat> the words that just left your mouth are not completely truthful or they're wrongful gossip. Know what it feels like when the peace of God is guarding your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Learn to know what it feels like when your heart is in constant communion with God. Learn to stay in that place more and more spiritually. How can you keep your heart? I think a lot of it is taking a few quiet moments during the day and thinking, now what is happening in my heart? Next time you have 10 minutes, try this. Go through Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, Faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Ask yourself, where is my heart on these things? Another great help <clears throat> is not complicated. It's just using the old-fashioned means of grace. Bible reading, private prayer, prayer in small groups, worship, obedience to God's word, caring for the needs of others, sharing Christ with those who don't know him, fellowship with God's people. Will we keep our hearts with all vigilance today, this week, for the rest of our lives? If we will, then from our hearts will continually flow the life of blessing and a manifestation of the presence of God. And God will look and be pleased 
and his favor and his blessing and his delight will rest on us through our days and our life will bring God glory more and more until the day he says, come home. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. I'm going to take some minutes and pray. Father, we come to you and we bring our hearts before you. We ask that you would shine the light of your Holy Spirit, the enlightening of the Holy Spirit into our minds and our hearts. That you right now would help us to know what's in our heart. Lord, where there is fear, will you give your peace and strong trust in you and overcome the fear and drive it out. Lord, if there's anger or bitterness, will you remove it, forgive us, forgive our hearts, forgive us of the anger and bitterness, Lord, and minister forgiveness to us and let us have power to forgive others and leave the results in your hands. Lord, if there's discouragement, will you give, will you give encouragement and hope and a confident trust that you will work all things according to your purpose for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purposes. Lord, if there are sinful desires, we pray that you would cleanse and purge our hearts from those desires and fill our hearts and minds with purity of thought and purity of love for you. And Lord, if there's jealousy, we pray that you would give contentment and with this strife and anger and bitterness, give peace and pour love into our hearts. We say with David, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Amen. <laughs>